Okay. Hi, everyone. I think we're going to get started. Um, my name is Rachel Adams. I am the Chief Curator and Director of Programs at the Bemis Center in Omaha, uh, Nebraska, which is where I am currently sitting on this rainy day. Um, Happy New Year, first program of the year. So I wanted to thank everyone for joining us today. Um, just an FYI, we are going to record this. So um, if you just letting you know, and I believe everyone is um, muted upon entry, but if, in case you're not muted, please mute yourself. And um, we will leave time for questions at the end, but you can use the chat function to chat questions in and uh, Joey and I will try to answer those um, after we talk a little bit. So um, yeah, I think we're just gonna jump into it. Joey, are you ready? Ready. Okay. <laughs> um, well, welcome to Between Two Screens. This is uh, the first of three programs that we're doing in relationship to our current winter exhibitions. Um, we have th three solo exhibitions up right now at Bemis, and we will uh, hopefully be reopening the galleries soon. We're closed at the moment due to COVID numbers, um, but hopefully we will be back up and running soon, and we'll let everyone know when that happens so you can schedule a visit if you're in the area to come see them. Um, the winter exhibitions are sort of umbrellaed under this um, title called Intimate Actions, and we have Joey Farso's um, Inside the Spider's Body, we have Maria Antelman, uh, Soft Interface, and Paul Mapagi Sequoia's Drop Scene. Um, we'll be doing talks with Paul next Wednesday on the 13th and with Maria on the 27th, all at noon. So I'm sure you've seen the emails and posts about that. So please rejoin us then so we, you can see um, what they have been up to as well. Um, okay, so we're just going to do, um, you know, a casual conversation about Joey and her work and her influences and specifically what she did at Bemis um, and just going to sort of jump into it. I hope, you know, if some of you are not familiar with Joey, um, we're going to also be chatting in links. So if you, you know, want to get to her website or um, see other things that we're talking about, please check the chat. Um, we'll have that kind of coming, rolling through as we talk. Um, Joey is based in San Antonio. She is an artist and a professor at Texas State University. Um, and she has shown all over the place, um, including Blue Star in San Antonio, Massamoka, North Adams. Um, recently, she was in State of, the Art, State of the Art at Crystal Bridges, which was at the beginning of 2020. Um, I've known Joey since I think like 2011 or 12 when we did a studio visit and I included her in a screening that I curated in, in Austin at what is now the Contemporary for the Texas Biennial, which is well, still one of my favorite videos that I've ever shown. Um, <laughs> one of my favorites too. <laughs> yeah, it's a really good one. Um, and yeah, so we, you know, some, I've sort of been following Joey's work for a while and was really excited to invite her to uh, do a solo presentation at the Bemis Center. So we're just going to jump into it. Um, oh, that's not the right button. Here we go. Um, so Joey, I was hoping maybe you could just do a quick intro about, you know, yourself as an artist and a little bit about your background, especially as a fellow Midwesterner growing up in Iowa. Maybe you can kind of talk a little bit about that as we sort of jump into this. Yeah, so I am a fellow Midwesterner. I grew up in Fairfield, Iowa, which is actually not too far from Bemis. Um, I grew and I was just there actually recently because they have um, an amazing art department as part of the university. Uh, my friend Gian Shrasbury teaches there. And um, so anyway, I like going back there a lot and, and was there doing a kind of a residency a couple of years ago. But um, I grew up in a transcendental meditation community in Fairfield that my parents helped to found um, in the late 70s. We moved there in the 80s. And I think that experience of being part of the TM community and growing up with this kind of focus on Eastern philosophy and spirituality and the kind of strange intersection of living in rural Iowa um, and yet sort of like embracing the aesthetics and philosophies of uh, Hinduism in the East and of the, the sort of the philosophy of the TM movement was 
continues to kind of inform and inject itself into my work in lots of different ways, as I'm sure we all feel like those formative years of like when we're children and adolescents are, are sort of supersized uh, in terms of how they affect our path throughout life. So I certainly have found that. Um, and the artist that came and um, collaborated uh, with me that continues to collaborate with me, um, David Herlin, who's also a musician, lives in Fairfield and our collaboration started there a couple of summers ago. Uh, and he did a performance at the beginning of our sort of virtual opening for this show. Um, but the, the image that you see on the screen, I think in some degree uh, expresses or it, or it like gives a snapshot into some of the things that I'm interested in. Um, I, I, I think of the work as sort of exploring painting in an expanded field, um, thinking about the intersections between painting, performance, and video of, of subject and ground, and thinking about sort of actors within a space or paintings as stage environments um, and performers within those environments. Um, more recently in the last few years, I've been embracing more three-dimensional work and more installation-based work. Uh, and I've also like for the last almost 10 years now have been working mostly monochromatically. Um, the work in this show, which you can kind of see that glowing blue light from behind the wall, uh, it includes a video from 2016 and then a new video from 2020, which is uh, titled Inside the Spider's Body. And um, actually with the exception of the video, all the work in this show is new work. Uh, yeah. So it, 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 this is such a complicated and difficult year, um, but um, I had a lot of time working in the studio this year to think about um, the ideas in the show. And I would just say, you know, one of the primary themes of my work, I think, is like sort of a cycle of making and unmaking or, or sort of thinking about creation and destruction in a way that sort of prioritizes that process over the individual preciousness of, of any given object within, within an environment. And also sort of thinking about the relationship between um, images and symbols and forms within the work and, and how their meaning is contingent on their placement or their positioning within this kind of like lexicon or universe that I'm constructing. Yeah, I think, you know, what I really, um, I'm gonna go to the next slide, Ooh, maybe. Um, what I really sort of gravitate towards, especially, you know, in the installation at Bemis is kind of this, yeah, it feels like this sort of, there's like mini stage sets, right? There's like scenes that are happening within scenes. They're different depending on where you're standing, you know, you're, you're sort of seeing work through other work. Um, there's a lot of layering that's happening and yeah, it definitely kind of, brings you, you know, like me thinking about like um, stage sets and props and things that you also have um, done in the past of sort of creating these environments and moving into this sort of more sculptural installation, theatrical, you know, based practice, which as somebody that's walking through, you kind of become almost like an actor in the, in the yeah. set as well, which is really exciting. You know, there's, there's a lot of sort of interaction. So I'm just kind of showing a few um, different views of, of the gallery here um, and the sort of different kind of vignettes that have popped up. Um, yeah, I mean, I think I wish um, like the experience of uh, being with those empty geometric forms and how they relate to the paintings is so physical in real life um, that I, um, I think it sort of communicates through the image, but like you said, like it is kind of a, a, a physical sort of perceptual experience. And I've, you know, that main piece that we were looking at, the cubes that go across the center of the floor, of, um, of the floor which is called uh, Coda. Um, and it, the, the imagery is um, sort of a compilation of images that I took at the Maharishi's funeral in Varanasi, India, which was this kind of, a very, um, you know, incredible transformative event for me. Um, but I think the experience for the viewer, one of the things that I'm really interested in is how shifting the, um, the perspective from the floor, from the wall to the floor, 
um, it, it still sort of creates a sense of a window as we think of traditional perspective, mm -hmm. but looking down into something, I think it really changes the experience. Like it feels like you're looking into a portal or into the earth. Um, so that's something, you know, I, I only started thinking about painting um, within these, these kind of geometric forms. I only started making these pieces um, about a year and a half ago. And so it's still kind of new to me, but um, yeah, I, I think I'm also interested in the way that unlike like a traditional frame, which sort of seeks to define a piece through substantive matter, like through solid material. In this case, the paintings become framed by the absence of space, like the negative space around the form is defined uh, by the painting and the frame for the painting becomes sort of like the emptiness um, above it, which I kind of interested in uh, continuing to explore. Yeah, it really becomes um, this very expansive experience, I think, in terms of, you know, you already have this like extremely long painting, you know, it's something like 20 something feet that you cut into these to fit into the cubes, but there's something that kind of happens with it, you know, within the cubes that sort of just expand it into, you know, the space above and the space beyond it in a way um, that is really exciting. But then also, you know, like this photograph where you're, you know, someone can just sort of stand right in front of one section of it um, and have this kind of interaction where it's kind of expanding upward to them, <laughs> you know, like it's kind of hard to describe, but, you know, kind of gives you an idea, I think. Um, and what I really, you know, have been thinking about a little bit, especially like looking at, you know, um, the paintings and thinking about, you know, you talked about sort of this creative destruction that kind of is part of your work, right? Like um, there's something that's so delicate about a lot of the, like the cubes themselves, you know, they're very thin and they look very like delicate as, and as well as some of the other smaller pieces um, that are along the wall, but then there's this sort of thing that they're really resilient and we can kind of talk a little bit about, you know, your, the preciousness is not the same, you know, like this is a painting sitting on the floor and you're like, just dust it a little bit <laughs> if it gets dusty, like, um, don't worry about it, you know, it should be fine, just make sure. And so it's sort of thinking about, I was thinking, you know, as like a registrar, we don't have a traditional register at Bemis. We're not, you know, a museum in that sense, but I would say that I'm sure that that's probably um, something that people are like, wait, what? You could just like move it around really easily. And, you know, it's just, they're, they're very physical in a sense, but then there's also this like delicateness that kind of comes in within the presentation. So. Anyway. Yeah. And it's a little bit of a challenge because like in some exhibitions, we've shown these on platforms, uh, but the, but they really, I think are much more, beautiful and interesting, um, you know, directly on the, on the, on the ground. So it's kind of a, it's kind of an interesting um, <laughs> challenge. Um, one thing I was going to say too, and this is a nice thing, like when you, I'm sure a lot of the people on this Zoom are artists also, and you know that experience when you made a whole new body of work and installed it, like it's, it's sort of percolating through you, the, the meaning and, and how everything has played out physically. Um, and so doing a talk like this, it, it gave me a time to sort of like think about some of the dynamics um, in, in ways that I hadn't. And mm -hmm. I think one of the interesting things that happens in this show is that the, the pieces that are landscape driven, the, um, these kind of portals or these forms uh, sort of in a certain way communicate a kind of freedom because it's, it's an, it makes you feel like you're moving into them or through them. But the ones that focus on women's bodies or you know women's portraits, they become um, constricted. You know that they're sort of trapped. They be, they become something that's this kind of fragile glass box or something that holds them in place. And and I think that that also um, is an is another kind of obviously like a theme in the show is sort of thinking about um, women's bodies in passive states in Western art and in more active states. Um, with more agency and autonomy and sort of thinking about being sort of within and outside of those kind of constructs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, you know, this, this um, painting um, that you made for the show, which um, we sort of dubbed the princess in the pea <laughs> painting a little bit um, with uh, Lorray, who's a collaborator of yours, who's also in the video that we'll show some clips from, but um, 
yeah, sort of, you know, being that sort of like being confined yet, you know, trying to sort of trying to spread out at the same time, right, to the like almost to the limit, um, being on top of all of these other paintings that are referencing, you know, different art historical painting traditions and, um, you know, acting the body sort of being this, um, you know, this this actor within the space that sort of moves through the space too. So, you know, as you're walking through the gallery, you're seeing, you know, this image of Loray and, and doubled in the sense, because obviously there's you know, two of her there, but then the sort of other universal woman um, that you kind of use throughout your, throughout your, um, your work. And then seeing Loray again, seeing yourself as well, like um, in the video from 2016, you know, there's sort of a lot of peppering around um, that I think is really interesting in terms of the body, like moving through the space and sort of moving through your work in a way, you know, like being physically like cut in, in, in one piece, um, for example, which we'll show. So do you want to talk a little bit about like the process of maybe like making this painting in particular? Because I think it's such an interesting one to, um, to talk about in terms of like the layering and the hiding of things and revealing of things. Yeah, you know, I I um I always quote Brian Eno to my students. Um, you know, that he says something about accidents being hidden intention. And um, you know, I think there's a like a wrestling, the longer that you are an artist and making art, sort of uh, continuing to put yourself in that, that kind of Buddhist, you know, the child's mind or that you're you're open to um things sneaking up on you or accidents and that kind of thing. And uh so like in the case of these paintings in, I mean, I have a, a pretty big space to work, but I make so many paintings and they're all, a lot of them are really large. So I pin them one on top of each other just to like save space. <laughs> and I started to notice these really like great relationships, you know, accidental relationships, interesting relationships between the intersections of the beginnings and endings of paintings and how, um, how as a viewer, again, there's this kind of physical experience of the, the weight and density of all these images layered on top of each other where you're just getting to see the beginnings or endings of them um, or how they start to you know, you know, st stack and create um, interesting formal relationships. So that is definitely sort of one of the places where these stacked paintings came from is just, noticing that something accidentally good happened in the studio. Um, and then I also, you know, kind of building off the show at Blue Star last year and continuing to think about performance and, um, you know, creation and destruction and using the painting in perform, you know, in performative ways that, um, you know, lets the, the paintings become sort of props and clothes and shelters and those kind of things. I had started to think about a piece that would sort of um, become an animation in the sense that the paintings would reveal themselves one at a time through Louise's performance. She would tear one down and then the next one would, you know, um, be there just for a few minutes or, you know, a few seconds and then it would also disappear. And so it'd be this kind of like changing of scenes and, um, and, and a creating a, a certain kind of like excitement or freshness just through the like the transmutability and the 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 um, the temporality of the whole thing that nothing was permanent and you couldn't hold on to anything. So um, th this, like you said, this piece relates very specifically to the to the video. A lot of the paintings miraculously that were in the video, you wouldn't think they would be saved because the video is so <laughs> visible. Um, but <laughs> a lot of the paintings in this piece are also in the video. So if you experience the show, I'll show you some clips, but you can, like you said, uh, Rachel, you can, you kind of get a sense of the, like the journeys of the paintings or the sort of like the physical experience of the, uh, of the paintings and how they've been kind of freed from the wall in different ways. Yeah. And I, you know, whenever I look at this, I also sort of feel like this painting in a way, like this piece in a way is sort of like my 2020, right? Like it just feels, you know, with all these layers of like, you know, especially of us like, you know, being home and not really like leaving our space and, you know, like pushing things off to the side or like stacking things up together. And then just like being that one person, like in, alone, like in your space. I don't know. There's something about it that um, is kind of comforting to me in the same way. Um, and, and not like anxiety driven, but, you know, I am interested in like, Ooh, what's under there, you know, like, as you're sort of like digging out from <laughs> all of the things that have happened over the last year. Um, 
So I'm a little sad that we couldn't, you know, reenact the performance um, due to COVID, but, um, you know, I obviously am very thrilled that I got to see what was under before it um, happened. And I love like pointing out this, your, your little bunny right here. Owen, yeah, my cute. treasured rabbit. Yeah, cute Owen rabbit. <laughs> well, you know, and also that idea that so much of art is, you know, that it, that's in institutions is, is hidden, you know, that it's in mm -hmm. storage. And this idea of like, what rises to the top and, um, you know, what's hidden beneath it and why I think is interesting. Um, yeah. I will say Lurie is, Lurie is the one um, when we were like packing these works up for the show, she, she said, oh, that looks like the princess of the pea. And I hadn't thought of it, but now I love that so much. And yeah. we found out that we both performed in yeah. <laughs> uh, productions of the princess of the pea. Mine was called Once Upon a Mattress in high school. Yes, yes. Um, <laughs> and I was um, in the princess and the pea. When you I were too. Like, Amazing. I was like nine or something. So yeah, it's definitely um, one of those things I hadn't thought about for a long time and this really unearthed that like childhood you know fun of like yeah stacking mattresses and like jumping around your room and um, finding things that you didn't you know necessarily knew were there so do you well, want to show um, a little bit of the video now I think you sure can yeah yeah all right I'm going to stop sharing my screen for a minute and yeah, okay. I was also going to say that and like a lot of Hans Christian Andersen fairy tales the princess and the pea is scary and shady and yeah. <laughs> casts women in very dubious lights. Totally. Okay, hold on, I'm going to share my, um, okay, good. So, um, so just to give a little background, can everybody see this? Let's see. Do you have some? I can. Yeah. Okay, good. Okay, I'm going to mute myself. For oh, I was hoping that I could do the full screen. Oh, I, but I guess I can't. That's okay. I think we can still see it pretty well. It's pretty full. Yeah. Okay. Um, so as I sort of just described in the video, this is, I'm, I'm going to show you a couple of clips from different sections. It's kind of a long performance. It's about a half an hour. Um, and in the video, the Larice starts by entering the space and all of the paintings are tacked to the wall as this kind of stage set. And over the course of the video, she tears them down and transforms them into clothing and shelter and kind of just like whatever she desires. The, the thing that was important to me was just sort of like creating a space of like um, agency for her to be able to play with the, the paintings and um, sort of have her way with them. Um, and the, the piece, which is a two channel video, moves back and forth between the kind of the macro and the micro. Um, seeing the kind of pores of the paintings at different points. Um, and it, it also moves between the kind of um, like the, the formal and the improvised. Um, and also there are passages where you see Larie sort of watching herself. So this idea of, you know, w women being the surveyed and the surveyor, which is not, has certainly not always been the case in, in Western art. Um, so anyway, I'll just show a couple clips. I'm gonna scooch forward um, after a minute or so, but.
yeah, so one of the things that I love so much about Livy's performance is that it sort of moves through all of these different incarnations. Like there's times where it feels very like utilitarian, like she's just trying to get the paintings off the wall and turn them into something. And then there'll be these moments when all of a sudden it's transformed into these beautiful, like a, a Velasquez painting or you know, it feels very formal. Um, and I was just gonna show you, tent, kind of give you a sense of the journey of some of the <laughs> paintings. Um, so you see like in that painting, you could see Louis tearing the, the, the painting of the woman off the wall. And this actually didn't end up in the show. The paintings were also, you know, <laughs> taken to the ocean and different kinds of environments. And then ultimately some of the pieces of those paintings then ended up in much more sort of formalized, um, quiet, still positions. But I, I think like, even if it's not always present in the show that um, that kind of journey and resilience of the paintings and a certain kind of like lack of preciousness is um, important is important to me. And I, th I think it does, do you think, Rachel, I think it comes through in the exhibition if you're paying attention to the, how the video relates to the, the work. Yeah, you definitely, especially if you've, you know, kind of gone through and then you kind of come back around and you, especially that piece in particular, which um, I also have a image of, so I'm gonna go back to sharing my screen now. But um, yeah, I think, you know, it's something really interesting for me is that idea of resilience and, um, the, yeah, just that they have these multiple lives, right? You like allow this work to exist as a painting, exist in a performance, exist as, you know, part of a, you know, more of a sculptural object, and then obviously exist in video. And so it sort of has, you know, I mean, as a work of art, they should be really excited that they've been able to live so many <laughs> different ways, I think, um, which I really love. And yeah, being able, sort of seeing them, here we go, it's that piece right there, um, you know, in, in different iterations. Um, and yeah, it's kind of exciting. And I, you know, it was funny when you told me, you know, oh, like I just brought it down to Galveston or, you know, wherever you can put it in the water and it's, you know, it's totally fine and looks good and still working. And um, yeah, again, just sort of like thinking about how, um, you know, how destruction can have many different like forms. Um, and it's not technically a, a negative word um, because it can be used to sort of, um, you know, recreate and reinform and, um, you know, showcase other things. Um, I wanted to pull up this image, which is something that you sent me, um, you know, some of your, your artistic influences um, and thinking through that. So I don't know if you wanna um, mention a few of these so people sort of know, you know, like your own personal like um, archive of what you what you're looking at and who you're interested in and things like that. Yeah, I mean, it's nice, like just just uh, our discussion of thinking about painting in an expanded field where um, gesture plays out in space and in time. Um, you know, a, a, a someone that I love who writes and thinks or did think a lot about that as Carolee Schneeman. There's a little image of her um, performing up to and including her limits. Uh, and actually there's a really beautiful show that is opening this week at Art Pace curated by um, Annette Carlazzi of um, Carolee's work and then artists that have been influenced by her. Um, I'm not in that show, but I cannot wait to see it. And um, it looks amazing. I just Yeah, it really does. That. So, you know, and, and I think like her, you know, a lot of her, she, in a certain way, I mean, from what I've read, she always considered herself a painter, uh, but was just interested in sort of taking those primary impulses of painting, the, the, the risk taking, the additive and subtractive processes, um, the flexibility of the medium and how it deals with representation and pushing that into, um, you know, into space so you know and and time in really interesting ways you know i was reading that like in her you know famous piece i body um she used a lot of her early figurative paintings that she cut up and reconfigured in 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 that piece which which i really love um 
I was also thinking, it's interesting because I was thinking about her getting ready for this talk and I, and I was thinking about the title of the show, which is Inside the Spider's Body. And I was thinking about her interior squirrel mm. as almost being sort of like, you know, because spy, spiders pull um, the silk, it's excreted out of their abdomen, you know, and it's this incredibly strong yet flexible kind of magical material. Yeah. And I, you know, I think there obviously there have been a lot of artists that have, uh, women artists that have used spider imagery in really interesting ways. But um, yeah, I, this is just like the, the tip of the iceberg of mm -hmm. uh, inspirations, but so, you know, some of the um, influences that I've been looking at a lot in the last few years are the mosaics of Pompeii and um, Greek pottery. Uh, there's images of artist Nancy Spiro, who is one of my favorite artists. And um, yeah, there are so many things I love about Nancy Spiro's work, but one of the, and this this portrait of her, I think it shows that one of the things that I love about her work is the way that her figures, her, you know, she mostly deals just with women's bodies, that they're always in movement, you know, that they're always doing something, they're always acting. Um, and so in that sense, they're sort of skirting the male gaze, skirting the um, sense of being watched or sort of that passive role that women, you know, both when in art and outside of art are often placed within. So um, yeah. I also, Carrie James Marshall, who's one of my favorite painters of all times. And again, questions history painting and um, the, the, the lens of history in really beautiful, interesting ways. And um, Kathy Kolwitz, there's a portrait of Mary Beard, who's a very spicy, wonderful art historian. Um, the painter Joan Brown. That image at the bottom is just a like an image I found. I follow like different sites of like medieval medical illustrations, and all the images of women are so amazing. Like whatever's happening inside that body, <laughs> so so magical and so wrong. Look, yeah. there's a baby in there down by the bottom. But yeah, there's a little guy in there. I think about uh, you know yeah how um, how we understand women's bodies or how women's bodies have been portrayed in Western art and how that relates to our lived experience is also interesting to me. So yeah, just I, I just also really love this. Um, I might have to make this the background of my computer for a little bit because it just sort of like the layering that you did of all these people, you know, influences and like people together. There's just something that like is this like beautiful collage. So I'm just gonna compliment you on that. Oh, thank you. Yeah. There's, 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 uh, um, yeah, I'm just going to show a few more, some more images of the show. Um, but yeah, I think that Caroline Schneeman and thinking about your, um, your bodies that are sort of moving or sort of in stasis here, you know, it's really kind of, um, I saw that as soon as I saw that portrait, I was like, I thought about your work immediately, which was obvious. Um, but, you know, thinking through this a little bit more, um, but yeah. yeah in, the, in that installation along the wall, you know, there, there's, I mean, there are um, tributes to specific women artists and sort of, you know, personal symbols. But I, but I think what what really threads it together is this sense of women's bodies being held in constricted space, and then the attempt to escape that space to to scramble out of it, and again to create these kind of. Um, delicate but charged relationships between the painted elements and the um, the linear kind of drawings, which you know are steel, but they to me they definitely feel like drawings. So there's um <laughs> so you know that that you could see the cat upside down cat, which is one of the things when I was thinking of including it, it made me feel the most nervous. But now it's one of the things I really love the most in the show. But um, you know, the way that this, this, this is the image of the cat, which is actually my sister's cat, Dorito, is held <laughs> upside down. Um, but also, uh, um, you know, sort of speaks to women's positions and um, maybe all of our positions this year. Um, yeah. And also plays tribute to artists like Carolee Schneeman and Joan Brown, who have used cats in really great ways. You know, obviously there's a strong relationship between women and cats. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Definitely. Um, and then here are some, 
images of um, like paper dolls that you made when you were younger, right? Um, maybe you want to talk a little bit about, I, I love these and these sort of scenes that you put them in and kind of thinking um, again, like through sort of staging, I feel like staging is such an important part of, um, of your work, especially like, you know, when people see the Bemis show, they really get a sense of that, um, you know, and I, I love this. Um, this series that you put together here, so. <laughs> yeah, you know, I did a lot of, um, I participated in a lot of theater and musical theater growing up and I had a wonderful drama teacher named Rodney Franz who I love and, um, but, uh, you know, so in, when I was growing up, I didn't take a lot of art classes at school. I mostly took these theater classes and Rodney gave me a lot of um, freedom to paint the sets. So I was like in there painting a lot of the sets. And I also think that is a kind of primary influence on how my work is developed is sort of thinking about actors and spaces. Um, but yeah, I've always liked to collect things. I think a lot of artists do, but I started um, when I was younger and then it's just continued to the present. These are, I think from college, but uh, making you know hundreds of these paper dolls and then at this point in time, I, what I would do is look, sort of construct these ambiguous stories. And I had all of these different backgrounds um, and different like wallpapers. And then I would like copy them on the photocopy machine to make these narratives. Um, mm -hmm. But if you come to my studio, those of you that have been to my studio, um, you know, I have many, many collections and boxes of paintings and cutouts and figures that, um, you know, some of them I continue to use, like now all the black and white figures and some of them are more archived like these paper dolls. But I think that's um, like all of us that are artists, I think we have things that we hold on to as being kind of central to what is joyful about making art or what um, is like important to us about making, making things. Yeah, I think it, I was, I wanted to show a few more images, especially this one, which I also love. Um, thinking about the, um, the magician's trick of cutting the woman in half. Um, but I wanted to um, touch on, here's the video room just so people can see that and um, we can link. I think um, the, this video is on your website, right? Joey, or on your Vimeo yeah, so people can watch it. Um, so Jared can link to that. Um, but I wanted to, thinking about wallpaper, I wanted to sort of move to this, um, this piece um, that uh, you made for the show and kind of talking about the, how it sort of came to, to look like this, um, because obviously um, when you originally were thinking about, you'd come up in August for a site visit and, um, you know, we're thinking about making a large, at one point, you know, with a mural and then we just, you decided you wanted to sort of paint it on canvas. Um, and then a few days before you got here, you know, think, saying, I think I want to um, tear this piece up a little bit when I get to Beavis. And um, so, you know, um, this is called, is this, this one's called Views of North America, right? Yeah. Um, based on um, a wallpaper that is um, currently and has been um, in the White House um, for quite some time since the Kennedy administration, um, which I have an image of here. So just so people can see it and I'm sure some people know some of these images well. Um, but yeah, Joey, do you wanna talk about, yeah, the, the wallpaper influence and um, this piece in particular, and I'll go back to the larger one. I had to include Trump at his tiny desk there. Tiny desk, man. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, so I have always loved um, wallpaper and I'm really interested in the history of wallpaper and specifically scenic wallpaper and sort of masters of scenic wallpaper, this French company, Zuber, that does these beautiful, um, incredible panoramic wallpapers using all hand block printed um, imagery. And the, the company started in the 1700s and they continue to use the same wood blocks to this day, which is incredible. And, I, and um, Riley and I got to see some of them in person on one time when we were in Paris, but um, this particular wallpaper, which is called Views of North America, that, that, that this painting is um, loosely based on, uh, it was originally created in 1830, and it was created by, obviously by Zuber, this French company, and the artist that, that um, painted it um, was basically copying from other artists who were copying from other artists, um, all, 
all French writers and artists who were interested in the American experiment and were, you know, sort of looking to uh, America as a beacon for certain um, embodied ideals, which, you know, in actuality, those of us, you know, we're all, you know, knowing that Jacksonian America, 1830s America was uh, a complicated and brutal place for many people, and especially Native Americans and um, African Americans. Uh, but so this, this wallpaper, which tells this kind of idealized story of um, America during the 1830s, and then also a later version tells the story of the American Revolution, which is, I kind of combined those two into this piece. Uh, but it was um, installed, it was salvaged from a house that was being torn down Obviously there are more than one version of it, but one of the versions that was in this house in New, Eden, New England was um, salvaged um, but, and then sold to Jackie Kennedy in 1961, who then installed it in the diplomatic reception room of the White House. And I just became obsessed with this idea of this kind of beautiful, problematic, idealized um, image of, American history, American identity um, as, a, as a backdrop for all of these different administrations and these di diff uh, different happenings. You know, there's a, iconic pictures of the Obamas in front of this wallpaper. And if you, you know, if you read about the diplomatic reception room, it's where a lot of really important <laughs> um, events and things happen. Um, and you know, during the Trump administration, there are oftentimes events taking place in this space. And so it became a kind of theatrical place, um, you know, that th the reception for Amy, Amy Coney Barrett was there. And then those images were later projected in the newspaper where you could see, you know, lines tracing possible uh, COVID transmissions. And so just very loaded, complicated images. And um, I've used that um, wallpaper as the beginnings for different paintings in the past. And like you said, I wanted to make a large piece for this show. Um, but I felt like um, something it needed to, uh, it, it, I wanted to act on the image. I wanted to transform the image that would, in a way that would express um, how, you know, how history is told through the, uh, the lens of the people that are in power and how history is, uh, you know, fallible and, and, and presents blind spots and redactions um, and um, elements that in hindsight um, we recognize as, as being false or as being, you know, different fictionalized ideals. Um, so anyway when I, I I wasn't sure what I was going to do I'd made the painting and I sent it up to Bemis and I was just feeling like you know unsure as to how it was going to function in the show and then a couple days before I came up to Bemis I had this kind of breakthrough in the studio where I realized um, that it could be really interesting to tear the painting into strips and then to have some of the images um, facing forward and some of the them facing backwards so oftentimes I paint on black canvas and it's Kind of hard to see from these images, but so that the black lines are the painting turned um, the other way, so that it sort of has its back back to the viewer. And because of the way that the gesso seeps into the surface, it almost creates this kind of like celestial quality, which I love. So mm -hmm. there's a kind of an abstraction and an affinity there, like a sense of um, I don't know like, of, of something more infinite and more um, fundamental and elemental than. Um, the narrative that's playing out in the painting. So it was a little, as you said, it was a little high stakes because when I got to Bemis, I had this idea, but I didn't really know if it was gonna work. And so I had to sit on the floor. It took me like eight <laughs> hours. And every, every time I tore a strip, which again, I think this kind of relates to the video because it was exciting. There was a risk element there. Mm -hmm. you know? Every yeah. time I was tearing it, it felt like, uh oh, you know, this, <laughs> this tear could go wrong or something, but um, it ended up, being like pretty um, uniform in terms of the of the, the the each strip. Yeah, and I think you know, as I was like wandering through, you know, as you're sort of doing this um, performance, non-performance of tearing it, you know, the the sound I think of of you tearing it, and then you know, again, once we got the video up, like hearing the sound of 
um, the tearing and that, and that actually like um, was something that influenced David when he did his performance, um, which, you know, we had set up in front of this was to eventually, you know, tear part of um, this painting that he had been performing on top of. And again, using that, that sound, I feel like is something that um, really has like resonated with me. Like I can almost like keep hearing it. And I was watching the video earlier too, and just sort of like thinking about like that particular like ripping of the canvas. Um, for some reason, it it's sort of heart-wrenching and soothing at the same time. <laughs> I'm not really sure. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, I love the, I love the way that this piece turned out and, and really, again, sort of thinking about the, um, the history of that, that wallpaper and all of the people that have been in that room and all of the things that have been said and not said. And um, I, I love the sort of reference to redaction. Um, and there obviously is this sort of react, like reference to like, you're almost like looking through like blinds um, also, which we kind of talked about a little bit and sort of thinking about the inside versus outside, right? Um, and, you know, um, who's sort of, who's on the outside and who's on the inside and, and what's, what's the truth there? Um, so that sort of has been um, something that I've been thinking about a little bit as well. Yeah, yeah, the, the, the definitely, that was another thing we were talking about that, that <laughs> because I think of the width of the strips, and the way that the black looks, that, that it also has a, you know, there, there, there's, because it's based on this 1830s wallpaper, there's a certain kind of romanticism and nostalgia to that imagery, but then the strips and the black also kind of give a sort of 1980s, 80s, like 70s office building feeling, which I think yeah. is kind of interesting. It plays against the romanticism of the imagery. Um, and also to me thinks of like, sort of like these like, um, <laughs> you know, like in my childhood, like images of like scions of American capitalism or something like you're looking out <laughs> at the, this office window in an 80s office building, but then you're looking at the American Revolution or something. So there's, yeah. there's an, um, but I was going to say, yeah, you know, the, the, the thing that I loved about having David's performance in front of that as a backdrop too, is that it, it spoke to you know, I, th I think that this idea of creation and destruction and, and what it means to tear something down or to question fundamental truths or stories that we um, have individually or collectively um, built our identities on is that it, it, it opens the doors to, um, you know, a wider lens of who we are and of who is heard and all those things. So I think like the David's performance was very joyful. And I mm -hmm. think that it was like a joyful destruction, which was um, a nice thing to, to take place, I think, with that as a background. Yeah, I think, you know, just watching it, it was sort of cathartic, I think, you know, it, it, um, it was really exciting. And, um, you know, in terms of obviously sound, there were like so many things kind of going on, but just, um, yeah, there was sort of this like cleansing in a way <laughs> that was kind of happening, you know, by, by destroying, um, you know, I, I always think about like, yeah, like controlled burns, right. Or like forest fires are supposed to happen because then there's regeneration and sort of like thinking about that, um, I felt was like really potent when I was watching the performance and experiencing it. So um, well, I would just say, like, for those that didn't see it, like, so David and I started two years ago, I did a ceramics residency at, at the Maharishi International University, invited by my great friends, uh, Gian Shrasbury and her dad, Jim Shrasbury, who are both artists that teach there. And um, so I came with the idea to, I don't have a background in ceramics. So I was thinking I would make all of these props and drumsticks and forms that could be used sonically. And then I'd collaborate with a drummer who would then like drum them into dust or, or, or break them uh, in the course of their performance. And so luckily I met David who is, um, was like, it was really a match made in heaven for this collaboration um, because he was already interested in, improvisation and and sort of the, the way that drumming and sound can happen in a lot of different places so um we did uh, we've done this is our third iteration of this collaboration and david actually himself now is working on these large-scale sonic installations that are very interesting yeah um okay the I, last thing i just wanted to end on um and we don't have to read this but um the title of the show comes from um, Adrian Rich's poem, Incipience. So just so people are aware of that. And I think 
Jared can link to where people can read it themselves. Um, but I think we might want to open it up for questions a little bit. Um, we'll just keep talking. Um, but um, yeah, are there any questions from the audience? I'm going to unshare my screen so you can see people. Um, please just chat them in and um, we will um, get to them. So questions or thoughts? There was, I did see a quick um, comment from Melanie who said that the tears almost appear as barbed wire on her screen. So that's kind of an interesting comment there. Um, yeah, that they, they do have, because um, the paint is really thick on the canvas and the canvas is a very thick canvas. So when you tear it, it does have this kind of beautiful sharp spiny edge, almost like the spine of an animal or an insect or something. Yeah, definitely. Um, well, I'll just, I'll start you off here. Um, what are you working on now that this show is over, Joey? Not over, but you know, installed. <laughs> <laughs> it's up until April 24th, plenty of time to see it. Um, I, well, I have a, a big show um, that I'm working on for next fall with Mackenzie Stevens um, for the Visual Arts Center at UT. Um, but I am, I don't know. I mean, I have some, I have some ideas. I just finished like we, like other artists know this, like you just put a big show together and then your combination of kind of like exhausted and depressed and anxious sort of what comes next. But I also, um, so the first thing I did is like clean my studio, organize my flat files, which I find very satisfying. <laughs> but I am dreaming of these. I do have some ideas for some um, new big paintings. Though I'm not sure the world needs more Joey Farso big paintings at this moment, but they will be coming. <laughs> and um, sort of uh, integrating some of, I guess, integrating uh, some of the landscapes with the, um, the 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 figures unmoored from the landscape in different ways. So yeah, I'm working on that, and I'm also working on um, editing a piece that David and I started two years ago. So mm. I'm working on that as well. Cool. Yeah, you had talked about um, some thinking about more set design and like bigger painting. So that's exciting. Okay, we have um, a question from Kathleen. The poetic source also seems reflected in the rel relevance of space between the works. Um, seem intentionally like pauses between lines and sections of a poem? That question comes from one of the wisest artists and teachers that I know in the world. So, I mean, that's more like a, just a brilliant observation that now I'm gonna fold into my artist statement, Kathleen. But uh, <laughs> yeah, I do think that like, I, I was thinking about that, like with that long Varanasi piece, the way that the, that the way that, um, negative space works not just in relationship of the framing of the paintings but between the images how that absence becomes kind of like a breath or you know again a sense of like the spaces like the absent spaces in our recollections in our memories in our kind of like you know most cherished experiences and um so yeah i definitely you know i was thinking about um one of, another one of my favorite um, poets is Mark Strand and one of his most famous poems is called Keeping Things Whole. And there's this beautiful line that says, wherever I am, I am what is missing. And the whole poem sort of like just speaks about negative space um, as positive matter or, uh, and, and um, anyway, I come back to that a lot, but. That, that's exactly. a very good <laughs> question. I, um, you know, I think, especially since, um, you know, you had mentioned that you wanted to title the show um, after Incipients. I've just been spending a lot more time with poetry. And I think there is something about um, the relationship between you and the negative space and, and the pause. Um, you need that, you know, I mean, I think that's something that um, is, you know, as a curator, I always like gravitate towards more minimal things because I feel like that negative space is really important in terms to have, you know, the work have that space. And I think personally, we really achieved that with this exhibition. So I'm very excited about that. Um, Michael asks, Joey, your work seems to exit on continuum of experiences rather than discrete objects or exist, I think is what he meant to say. Um, do you see it that way? Has that changed over time? 
Um, yeah, <laughs> I love like this is like a collection of all people <laughs> that I love and know. I see like, hello, Hamlet. Hello, Michael. Um, but uh, yes, I definitely think that the work has moved towards um, something that is more open ended and more process driven and more personal and drawing more from personal experience. And I think that um, I've talked a lot about that in the past in terms of this kind of breaking open that happened um, when my kids were little and I was diagnosed with breast cancer in my thirties. And it was, um, you know, like a lot of hard things, it ended up being not in all ways, but in many ways, kind of a positive revelation and just the sense that like, it sort of established the stakes of things and the, um, that, that, that time wasn't unlimited. And so to let the sort of work get messier and have more heart and be more personal and just embed into my, into my life and into my like emotional experiences more. And so, yeah, I, it, it did kind of like make me think about what, like where do you want to put your eggs, <laughs> you know, what baskets, so. Um, I was, and I actually sent you an email earlier um, for this um, piece that just came out from the Rivers Institute in New Orleans um, by Eleanor Karachi, but sort of, we didn't even talk about kind of like, you know, this, this um, the intersection of being, you know, a parent, um, specifically a mother and an artist and sort of how that has really influenced your work. Um, Mackenzie is asking, can you talk a little bit more about your move away from color and how working in black and white or monochromatically functions within your work, um, thinking about its purpose, so. Hi, Mackenzie. Uh, yeah, you know, so that began, um, that, that sort of, I mean, I guess it was already sort of beginning, but that, way of working really took hold when I stopped using oil paint and started using acrylic, which I made that choice because I was just trying to cut down on toxicity uh, after I had that cancer diagnosis. So I, luckily I was on a year sabbatical from school. And I always say like, it, for those of you that are like real painter, painter people, moving from oil to acrylic is like, you know, it's a big jump, you know, and I was trying to find a way to make sense with this other medium. And so I started working in a, in a painterly way that was subtractive, which is almost more like a two-dimensional carving in the sense that the paintings are made, um, I paint on the floor, I paint flat, and then I you know, add the paint and then use a lot of different kinds of like squeegees and kitchen utensils and um, clay tools and different things to kind of carve out the image from that surface. So the, the monochromatic began kind of out of a practical thing. Like I was like, okay, I'm gonna start working this way and I'll just start with one, one, I'll just start with black and white and see how it goes. Um, and I, I, I don't have like, I'm not, I don't cling to the black and white as something that defines me that I'll always only work in black and white, but it, it has been such a like exciting generative place. I feel like I have more to go with it um, before introducing color, but I feel like it does some other things that are important, which is that it creates a really nice, um, formal intersections between the videos and the paintings because the videos become very flat in terms of how the paintings operate within the videos. So it almost, um, you know, the, 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 the relationship between what's painted and what's live action sort of collapses, which I really love in the, um, in the videos. And I also think that working just in black and white, it allows sort of the multitudes of things that I'm working with to, formally hold together in a way where they they make sense. You know, there's so many different um, images and, and references and, and kind of like stories being told, but all of them in this framework of black and white, I think it, it gives a certain kind of logic. Yeah, and I think that um, that for sure holds true when you sort of walk in because you're like encompassed sort of within that um, environment, I think. Um, but um, yeah, there's there's something about about the black and white that's just so, um, I don't wanna say like, it's like, I wanna say warm, and, you know, like even though it's not, like, it's not a tone, you know, there's something about it that, um, that just sort of makes sense. And I think that, um, yeah, like I love the way that the the videos do have that sort of flattening that happens um, 
and well, you know they, with Lorray like then like pulling it down and it sort of creating a like coming to life in a in a different sense um, if that was color I don't know how that would feel you know well uh, yeah I I'll just the last thing I'll I don't want to run on but um, I think that the black and white because the paintings are sort of scraped out and becomes also like indexical records of the floor of my studio or wherever I'm painting, um, that the black and white allows the, um, the texture and the, and the gesture to be primary. Like you really sense those sort of carved gestures and, and how they define form in a way that might be obscured um, if, if color was present. So again, like the, uh, I think about this a lot in different things with teaching and my work, but by sometimes by adding those sort of restrictions, um, it gives you more room to really explore within that space. So I feel like other things become more visible because the color's not there. Yeah, definitely. I think that's, yeah, the visibility is different. Um, okay, we have one more question um, from Hamlet. You mentioned your children. Could you talk a little bit about having kids and how that has impacted your and expanded your practice. Um, he says he's asking as a parent who's also curious. And then the same goes for teaching. Um, could you talk about how teaching has worked um, for your practice? Um, yeah, so I was also gonna say that Hamlet has been posting on his Instagram. They should follow the, the artist Hamlet Dobbins because he's an incredible painter. Um, and he also, he's one of my favorite Instagram people to follow because he's also always posting um, incredible books of poetry to check out. So mm -hmm. you get to see his paintings and poetry recommendations. Uh, <laughs> but I would say like, I think that, um, God, it's been, it's been such a discussion, right? I think it, it's this, this idea of motherhood and parenthood and how children um, coexist with you know how you coexist with you know being a parent and being an artist it's talked about so much more than I think it was like when I was in school which is nice um I think for me and th there are like so many different solutions like I was I just read this great book by the artist Celia Paul who was Lucian Freud's partner I hate to define her that way but she, mm -hmm. she's a great painter but anyway you know she, there was one solution, especially at that time to, to being a mother. And, you know, then you some someone like Nancy Spiro who, um, you know, her, her solution was maybe to, to not make work for a while and to really dig into um, activism and research when her children were young and then to really just like explode into this incredible creative space. Um, but for me, uh, the choice, again, this, this happened at the time when my kids were little and I had a diagnosis of cancer. I just changed the way I thought about my life as an artist and my life as a parent. And I let those two just completely, um, you know, inform each other or enter each other's spaces. So I started to like be, uh, become more aware of just how incredibly creative and interesting the things that my kids were making were and inviting them into the studio and having things in the studio not feel so precious. And um, so, yeah, I definitely feel like having, I have two sons with my husband, Riley, and, um, you know, I think it's made me a better artist and um, I don't know, it's brought, it's definitely, um, I don't know. I could say a lot about that, but I, the, the piece that, that uh, I did with them over two years was called You Destroy Every Special Thing I Make. And over a two year period, we, the boys and I together like built hundreds of these elaborate setups, kind of like their block setups and then videotaped them being demolished in different ways. So um, I have made a number of pieces with them. Um, and then I would say like as a teacher, um, I, I think, I think being a like being a teacher, um, yeah, it's such a gift. I love my students at Texas State. Um, I have so many interesting, dynamic people that I've gotten to work with over the years that have then become friends. And you know, I, I think it helps to keep your practice fluid um, and 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 thinking about how to be a good teacher helps to inform like assumptions you make in the studio. Like I oftentimes am realizing I'm telling my students something and then I go back and realize like, God, 
don't be a hypocrite. Like you need to be doing that in your own studio and it does, um, it does help. So yeah, I love, I teach at Texas State, which is um, a big state school south of Austin. And um, yeah, it's, it's a, it's a, we have a great community of faculty and a great, great bot student body. Well, I think we should wrap up. That was awesome. Thank you so much, Joey. And you, thanks Rachel. <laughs> everyone for the questions. Thanks, Jared, for all the links. Thank you. And um, yeah, thanks for joining us. Um, if you um, are interested in these talks, we have another one next Wednesday with Paul Mapagi Sapoya. Um, so please join us for that. And um, yeah. And if you're in the area, please come visit Bemis. We'll hopefully be open again soon. Yes, thanks again, Rachel. Thanks, everybody. You're welcome. Okay, bye, everyone. Have a good Wednesday.